I have a bunch of slides that I put on the to DVDs for you. You can pick and choose whichever ones you want. There's some you might just photograph while you're here, but there's one in particular where I'm sitting on a on a veranda on Bickerton Island with Gula, and he's beside me like this. He's got his white hair and his beard, and I'm playing the didgeridoo. Okay. That was just before he told everybody to go. I had somebody snap the photo. And then he told everyone to leave, like he did when we were doing the music. So I figured something's going on. He'd hung up his tapping sticks, which means that he'd stop singing for ceremonies. He was getting older. It would be about 96, I guess, something like that. His voice was getting a little throaty, and kind of like Leonard Cohen, yeah. <laughs> and, but he said he wanted me to play for him because by then I'd learned how to play the way they play, play the didgeridoo, right? And they have certain tunes they play on the didgeridoo. And I, I was wanting, it'd be a big deal. To play with Gula was like playing for the Berlin Philharmonic for Herman Carrion or something, you know, this, this is a big deal. This is the man, right? So we went on the veranda and he started sing and the way you sing is you start with the tapping you want to go behind you there give me the tapping sticks the big ones behind you no oh, way behind way way there you go it's two of them All right so he's got his tapping sticks so the, the way it works is this that's what it sounds like if you do that doesn't work this works so he starts with his tapping sticks so in and kind of the way it works is, this is kind of a sonic sound bridge. Boom, it gets you across there. It kind of goes across between these two dimensions. All right, there's another, this dimension, then there's this other dimension. That's the present that keeps going in another dimension after you die. It's there, it's right here, it's in this room. It's just there, you can't see it. So this gets you across, right? So they start with the tapping sticks, and then the didgeridoo starts. Dum -da -da -dum, dum -da -da -dum. That gets you across, if you're doing it right, you're summoning up your inner spirit, which is below your navel, which is exactly key in Japanese, Chinese, ki, chi. You summon it up, and you, on your breath, it goes out the didgeridoo, okay? It goes over on that little sonic sound bridge. Right, so, you, so he's tapping. You're playing didgeridoo, and then he sings. So he brings his spirit up, out, on his voice on the song and he goes over okay so what i knew about this point is i knew that when they go over they go somewhere spiritually they don't stay here they sit here and they go somewhere else we talked about that earlier so i'm thinking <laughs> if he's going to do that when he's singing maybe when i play did you do i'll do the same thing i'll go over as well and I'll have the same kind of experience he's having. And he was, he was singing um, uh, Do All You Curl You, which is a very important song. And actually qualify that. Nobody in their culture sings Do All You or Curl You or Goanna or, or King Brown Snake, because that would be singing one. Nobody is that. Everybody is a part of one of those. So you're named on a part of the curlew. It's ling wings flapping in the breeze and the sound of it. You're named on the sound of a, of a king brown snake as it's going through the bush. Your, your name is on that. But nobody is king brown. Nobody is curlew. Nobody is uh, goanna. Nobody is kangaroo. Everybody's part of something like that, right? We come along, we need them surnames, so we give them surnames so that like, everybody's that clan. But nobody's actually in a clan. They're all part of each other in a different way. They're all part of Curlew in a different way or part of Goanna in a different way. But nobody is a thing, an, a unity or an entity. They're not like that. It never was like that. And we've done that. 
we've recreated their culture as a bunch of units, which they never were. So everybody's themselves. So, you know, you're a little bit of the wings and the curl, you know, a little bit of the, the silt that's, that's churned up in the river by the stingray. And then we can relate because those two things relate together in the, in the, in the dream time. So, I don't know. so anyway, he's singing curl you. So I'm thinking, well, his part of curl you. I call it curly, but singing is part of curly. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm it's, at the beginning, it's pretty nervous, right? I'm nervous and playing for the master, uh, making mistakes, I can't keep up. I'm not in the rhythm. So he stops and he starts again, sings again. So we start two or three times and starting to get into the rhythm, right? So now we're kind of into it. He's really singing well. And I'm playing, I'm, I've got the rhythm that matches his singing cadence. It's never the same as his cadence. It's different. It's always off a beat or two. So he may be, you know, two beats to a measure. I might be three, you know, something like that. So anyway, so we're going off like this. Then all of a sudden, I'm not there anymore. I'm up in the sky. And I'm flying along like this. All right? I'm looking down. All I'm seeing is I'm looking down like this. And below me, there's these fields. And there's a road going between the fields. And there's fences between the fields. And I'm, I'm like this. And then I'm not thinking. I'm just floating. And then something happens. I realize where I am. I'm not where he's going. He's going to where his spiritual stuff is. Because that's what attracts him. And his dream time things. They're all his, not mine. I'm here. I'm traveling down the Scotch line where my parents first moved to when we came to Perth and I'm coming in towards Perth over that highway. And as soon as that consciousness hits me, I'm back just playing the didgeridoo. And that was my experience. Had it been anything else, it would have been fake. But I knew that it had to be real because it was consistent with the whole underlying assumptions of this culture. That you go where your spiritual stuff is, you don't go where somebody else's is. And that's another mistake anthropologists make, right? They think it's their culture for them. No, their culture is for everybody. We can all do this if we learn how to do it. Well, I never did it again. I've tried, but it's different. You're just in that specific zone with the sky, right? And that's what happened. That's kind of cool. And a beautiful thing, you know, you're floating along like this. He's still there. And that's the confirmation I knew that this is what they do. And then his daughter, she, she came back. She was down south. She married a teacher, his Gula's daughter, when she was, I guess, early 20s, late teens. So they moved down south to teach. And <clears throat> Gula wanted her to come home to be part of the culture, right? And she knew quite a bit. So I was sent down to get her on my way back to Canada, going down to Sydney on the train from, uh, from where I was going. And uh, so I stopped in to see her and I kind of told her what her father had said, that he wanted her to come back with her husband and learn, learn more about the culture and take a role in the community, right? So she did. I came back here and she eventually went back to Great Island and lived there. So the next time I went back, I was talking to her. She said, you know, I never believed any of the stuff my father was teaching me when I was young. She said, but I do now. And I said, what happened? She said, this is what happened. Gula was planning to hold a ceremony with elders on Groot Island and the adjacent mainland. And they were having to negotiate the time and the place where it would be held. And so he told her that he was going to travel over there that night to the mainland and talk to the elders over there to make arrangements. And she said, how are you going to do that? It's a 40, you know, 30 mile trip across open water and there's no airplane. I said, no, I'm not going to go like that. <laughs> I'm going to go different. So she said, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going to go in the bush. I'm going to paint up, paint up white ochre, a whole body. <clears throat> I'm going to go into the bush with my sticks. I'm going to sing myself over there. And I'm going to meet with these people who are doing the same thing. And have our meeting, and then we're going to come back. 
So it's like, sure, sure. So night falls. <clears throat> He's gone. Next morning, he comes out. And she says, yeah, did you have your meeting? He says, yeah, this is what we talked about. And he recounted the conversation that he had with these people over there, right? And she's like, oh, come on, you know, give me a break. <laughs> she goes over to the council office where there's a telephone. She picks up the telephone and she phones over to the council office over at Numbawar and asks to speak to one of the guys he claimed to have met. He repeated that conversation. She, he told her word for word that they'd met together and had this conversation. There was no possible way he could have possibly done that. First of all, there's no phone except inside the council office, which is locked. And you're not going to get anybody at the other end because it's locked in their council office. That's the only phone there is. You can't go over by water. By the time you got over, be time to co you wouldn't get back in time for the next morning. And you can't fly. And she said, after that, <laughs> that's it. Uh, everything he taught me after that, I just took it in. And now she's one of the two left who can sing herself over. And she's a woman, and that's unusual. Maybe not in the past, but recently, in recent history. Women generally don't do that. They follow the singing, they don't lead. Well, her ambition is to eventually lead the singing when their culture gets back together again. And now she, Gula told me, like, not to tell her, but he said that she's one of the two people left who can actually transport herself. But she has to learn more about it and how to do it. So pretty cool, eh? That's before he died, eh? Big loss, tremendous loss. There's also a picture on my slides of me with him the last time in the hospital holding his hand. It's a beautiful picture. Yeah, I miss him. We had a deal. Whoever goes first, the other one hangs up their tapping sticks. So when he dies, I stop doing research, which I did. When he died, that was it. I could go and visit part of the people. No more studying. No more asking questions. He said, you know enough already. You don't need to. And he wasn't right. He was, of course, he's wrong. Of course, I could always have learned more. But there weren't that many people to learn from after him, really. Some, not many. Javanese, the last one, and I still talk to him. But, uh, yeah, he was amazing. Amazing. I had him appear in my bedroom one night in here, in Toronto, in my apartment in Toronto. I had him in a corner in the middle of the night. I saw this apparition. And the next day, I got a telephone call from one of the Aborigines, Javani, asking if I would come back to Australia to do some work for them. Because their clan was being under siege from another clan who wanted them off the island because they were essentially immigrants back in the 1920s. They want me to come back because I had the evidence that they belonged there. They thought I had the evidence, which I didn't. Because <clears throat> I I'd already saved the... this. Once the mining company came, the politics changed a lot. Eh? Instead of the renunciative thing, it started to get... It's for me, it's for us. So, so the mining township land became... It was Aboriginal land, but... There are certain people, Aboriginal people, who are trying to wangle it to be exclusive w without the renunciative, you know, thing. And uh, they were trying to stop it. The other, this other group was trying to stop them doing that. So I, had, I got involved in that. I brought back some bark paintings and some t tapes. If you, you can move around, in Aboriginal Australia, you can move around, eh? Like you can migrate under certain conditions. Famine is one of them. If there's nothing for you to give to anybody, you got you, you got to move. So the way they do it, you don't go and invade somebody's territory. What's the point? They're going to give you stuff anyway. What they do is they subdivide part of their land in two, usually on the same dreaming. So that, say, the west wind blows over from Bickerton to the mainland, or to the Groot Island. Where west wind lands on Groot Island here, he didn't do anything, so he kept on going, but he did something here, and there's a rock formation that he made, right? If, if they figure out eventually that he actually did something here, then the people over here who belong to West Wind, they can maybe live there, because they have a primary dreaming there, which people didn't know about till they saw the signs. See, it's very pragmatic. It's not fixed in stone forever. So this, this group from, came from the west coast of Bickerton, 
over to Groot Island. God knows when, 1800s, late 1800s probably. We don't know. And they had a ceremony and the, the Dragba people here d divided part of their land off and gave it to them because they had a West Wind dreaming here. Come the mining company occupied that township. That land is their township. Then Wanaya, who was head of this group that was here, wanted to claim that as an exclusive territory, right? But these people here don't have none of it, right? It wasn't exclusive to them. So they wanted, these people wanted evidence that the, this land belonged to to these people and was given to them by these people. So I had to bring back evidence that the ceremony had happened, the land had been turned over and all this kind of stuff. So I did that. And the, the guy from that land here gave painted two pa paintings in the upstairs for me as a reward. And they said they were going to, um, they, they were going to build me an outstation house so I could come back and live there forever. Because uh, on the outstations, they move, they started moving out from the communities into their own lands on the coast and stuff. So anyway, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so much stuff. You don't know where, you see, your mind goes a bit and then it goes a bit further and then it goes further and you start being in the moment a bit more. And the more in the moment you get, the more real it becomes. Now I can see that meeting that we had and I can see in my mind, I can see them all. I can see who was talking. I can see who was talking to me. And you know what happened? I just turned up with the evidence. They had a meeting and nobody wanted the evidence given to them because just me coming back was enough. They believed it didn't matter if I showed them anything. So everybody knew what the solution was before I even got there. I just got there and they said, yeah, okay. And they all went home. And I can see that now because it was a big deal. You know, all these elders, tribal guys and sitting around and they just get up and leave. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, but you want to see these, you know, hear the tape, you know, you know. Yeah. So that's the big, what else, Australia? That's pretty well a summary of it all. There's not much left in principle. I mean, there's lots of detail. Lots of things happen there. And, uh, lots of f funny things. Funny things. They test you, right? Especially when you get there, they test you. Whether you're going to chase the women or not. Because that's what the mining company people do. That's what they were doing. They had these really rough southern whites coming up to work in the mine, uh, strip mining. And they're after the Aboriginal women. So when I got there with my wife, they want to know if you're like them. So you're walking through the bush one day. We had a, we had a staging house on one side of the river. Our tent was in the middle of the community. The river goes in the middle. So we had to walk from here over to here every evening. And this is where the snakes were, right? So you learned how to deal with snakes. You hear the grass rustling? Stop. Turn off your torch. And when you hear the grass stop rustling, take off, right? So I'm, it was late afternoon, it was light. So I'm walking there. Suddenly, two young Aboriginal women appear on the path in front of me. One of them says to me, do you want this girl? And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, what's this? So I... I turned around, I went back into the community and I yelled at the top of my voice. There's this two dead ringa in the bush who are trying to, you know, make trouble for me. Awen Yemba, Awen Yemba. Dulyabit dead ringa, Awen Yemba. I don't worry. Of course, everybody comes out, right? And they got a hiding and I got off lightly, you see. They didn't do anything, see. And that was it, that was the test. I wanted to know if you were going to be like the rest of these white guys. This was, it was set up. This, it wasn't just two girls. This was a setup. <laughs> and I'm sure that happens a lot of times when you're in the field. You know, 
uh, anyway. Yeah, between between the, te the time he died and geez, when it would be probably when they took Suzuki back, it was chaos. My life was chaos. <laughs>